Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized this event. This is one of over 900 programs we've had at the Commonwealth Club since the pandemic began a little over two years ago. And uh, we're happy to bring another virtual program to you uh, so that authors can keep talking um, in spite of the fact that up and down, we can either get people into the uh, Commonwealth Club or not based on what's going on with COVID. So uh, today we have Edwin Birnbaum. He's here to speak about his book, Sacred Mountains of the World. It was a uh, pick by the Commonwealth Club as the best nonfiction book, uh, I think it was last year. And uh, he has um, brought, first of all, worldwide experience with mountains uh, to this, but his own personal experiences and a complete knowledge, well, complete is not possible, but a complete knowledge of the, the myths uh, that are associated with it and the religious feelings, the sacred feelings about different mountains throughout the world and human history that are shifting a little bit in our modern times, but still uh, dominate the way that we think about mountains. So Edwin, uh, thank you very much for joining us at the Commonwealth Club. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I am gonna show some slides on the overall subject of Sacred Mountains, and then we'll get into a discussion. Um, so what you're seeing here, as I mentioned, is a mountain on the edge of the Tibetan Plateau in Sichuan province in China. And it was the first time that I went to Tibet. Uh, we'd just taken off at dawn from Chengdu and came above the clouds. And here was this peak, Minyakanka. So as I mentioned, uh, it goes, my interest in mountains goes back to my earliest memories. Uh, when I was two years old, my parents were in the Foreign Service and we moved to Quito, Ecuador in the Andes. So my earliest memories are snow-capped peaks on the equator like Cotopaxi, which you see here. And uh, I also, we moved back to Washington, D.C. and I kind of fell in love with snow. To me, there was something, I wouldn't have put the words on it when I was a boy, but there's something spiritual about snow when it falls, it's mysterious. Everything is transformed, it's white, it's very smooth. So I returned, we returned to Ecuador when I was about 15. And um, I thought, wouldn't it be neat to go up to snow on the equator, the conjunction of opposites. So I went up, uh, I started climbing with an Ecuadorian mountaineering club called New Horizons. And I went up into this magic world of just incredible beauty. Uh, for example, wind sculpted snow in a glacier here. Um, I uh, then went on and was climbing at, uh, in college. Uh, I was at Harvard and the Harvard Mountaineering Club was quite active. And after I, I went on an expedition to the second highest peak in Alaska. And then after I graduated from college, I went to Nepal with the Peace Corps. And I went on an expedition to one of the peaks in a range called Annapurna. And Annapurna was the first of the world's highest peaks to be climbed. It's actually, uh, named for the goddess Annapurna. She is filled with rice or provides food. And there's an, sort of an amusing story, which is that uh, this mountain played a, a major role in my getting interested in mountains and sacred mountains, because when I was a teenager, my sister checked the book Annapurna out of the library, which was an account of the first expedition to climb Annapurna. It was the first of the world's highest peaks to be climbed. And she thought it was a Nancy Drew type mystery story about a girl named Annapurna. Um, <laughs> she wasn't interested, but I was fascinated by it. And uh, I won't go into the details, but what the, uh, the um, author, who was a climber named Maurice Herzog, a Frenchman, when he reached the summit, he had a sort of a spiritual experience in which all his... Uh, his perceptions of everything around him became very crystalline and just transformed how he was relating to what he was seeing. Uh, we were trying to climb the peak there in the center, which is called Annapurna South, about 24,000 feet high, and you see a cloud coming down. Uh, that's an avalanche. And if you look over here, there are what are called hanging glaciers. We were going up through this area here, uh, trying to get on the ridge, and the hanging glacier broke off and huge ice avalanche hit us. I was swept down about a thousand feet, buried, and I uh, got out in sort of a strange way. Following that, I went out to the Everest area, and I wound up climbing the most difficult peak I'd ever climbed. It's this peak here. It's just under 20,000 feet high. The monastery you see in the foreground is the monastery of Tengboshe, which is the main Tibetan Buddhist monastery on the south side of Mount Everest. Uh, it's a main monastery for the Sherpas, and this was the view from the summit. 
Now, I came down from the top of the mountain on Christmas Day, got back to Tengboche, and learned that the abbot of the monastery, the Rinpoche, as he's called, head lama, was about to walk to Kathmandu, which is about an 11-day walk through the mountains. So I wound up walking with him and a group of Tibetans and Sherpas. I was the only Westerner. And uh, in the process, uh, I, I, we got interested in the project to list and microfilm Tibet texts at his monastery. So I came back to do that. And on one of these trips, uh, he gave me this robe, which you see here. So this is a Tibetan nobleman's robe, one of the peaks behind it. So uh, I originally went to Nepal in part because I was interested in mountains, obviously. I was interested in the culture. But I became interested as a result of this in what mountains mean to people. And that led to, among other things, writing my first book, which was called The Way to Shambhala, which was about Tibetan myths and legends of hidden valleys resembling the fictional Shangri-La of Lost Horizon. Uh, as a result of doing that, I went back to graduate school at Berkeley and did a PhD in Asian studies and comparative religion and mythology. And out of that, uh, eventually, when I got my PhD, I, the opportunity came to write the book on sacred mountains of the world. So I went ahead and did it. Um, as an interesting story there, uh, the book came out in part of an all-day seminar that I gave at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington. And uh, when I was there, uh, I said, well, you may think here in Washington, you're far away from any sacred mountain, but just up the mall is Capitol Hill. And the model for Capitol Hill is Mount Sinai, because that's where the laws come from with Moses and the Bible. I said that off the top of my head. Well, my younger son went on a school trip from Berkeley High to Washington, and he went into the chamber of the House of Representatives, and there around the ceiling were reliefs of famous lawmakers, and right in the center was Moses with the Ten Commandments, the basis of law and ethics in Western society. So let's begin with the mountain just up the valley from Tengboche, which is the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. And I would venture to say that Everest is sacred in the secular sense as the highest mountain in the world, because in particular in Western society, Western society puts a value on whatever is number one, and Everest, of course, is number one. So there's a whole mystique that's developed around it. And climbing Everest has become a metaphor or a symbol for the highest goal you can strive to attain, whether your pursuit be material or spiritual. Now, to get into the more spiritual side of climbing, the most famous reason for giving, given for climbing mountains is um, uh, because it's there. Um, uh, if you remember... And you have to ask a second question. Uh, this was asked by George Mallory, who disappeared on Everest in the 1920s. Uh, somebody was asking, why are you climbing Everest? And probably to get rid of a questioner, he said, because it's there. It's the one that you know people always think of, and it has this almost Zen simplicity to it. So I think you have to ask a second question, which is, what is the it that's there? And that I, I would say for many climbers, some consciously, some unconsciously, there are many reasons for climbing, the it for many of them is the experience of something of deeper significance or reality that gives meaning and vitality to their lives and that's worth risking their lives to do. So this is a picture actually of uh, George Mallory and another climber at 27,000 feet on Mount Everest in uh, 1922. Now, you notice they're, they're wearing outfits that they could have been wearing tramping around in the hills in England. Uh, this is what people wear these days. And you can see uh, they were a lot tougher back in the 1920s. <laughs> so what about the name of Everest? Well, Everest is named for the uh, head of the Survey of India, Sir George Everest. Uh, but there is a Tibetan name for it, Sherpa name, called Chomoluma. And it's almost always mistranslated as goddess mother of the world or goddess mother of the universe. Um, this is how it's uh, written. Jomalangma is actually the more correct uh, Tibetan pronunciation for it. And uh, in fact, Everest is not the abode of a goddess mother of the world. It's the abode of this deity who's relatively minor. And the name Jomalungma is short for her name, Jomo Miolang Sangma, because Tibetan is a monosyllabic language, which means each syllable has the meaning as a word. So they just take a long string of syllables and they reduce it to just a few. Uh, she's a relatively minor goddess because you appeal to her for wealth and long life, worldly benefits, but not the higher benefits of spiritual liberation in, for example, Buddhism in particular. So for that, 
you go to this mountain, which is Mount Kailas. It's in Western Tibet. Everest is 29,000 feet high. Kailas is only 22,000 feet high. Um, but it stands out by itself. It has the shape of a dome, like a, a stupa or a temple. And it's the most sacred mountain in the world for about a, a billion people, not a million, but a billion people, followers of four religions, at least Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and an indigenous Tibetan religion called Bun. Uh, so this is the mountain here. Um, when I won the uh, Commonwealth Club's gold medal for nonfiction, um, I wasn't able to come to the award dinner because I was on my way to this mountain. So my wife, Diane, came to the Commonwealth Club and accepted it for me. And I wrote a little speech, which she read for me, which was very nice of her. So the mountain, as I said, is sacred to Hindus. This is a Hindu bathing in a lake near the foot of Mount Kailas, which is higher than the summit of Mount Whitney here in California. And he's making an offering to Shiva, one of the three forms of the supreme deity in Hinduism, who is believed to have his abode on the summit of Mount Kailas. Now, for Buddhists, or Tibetan Buddhists in particular, uh, they... Just, uh, just one question. How cold is that water that he's in? 33 <laughs> degrees? Pretty cold. 30. Well, I'll tell you, actually, that was the second time I came out. I went out there in the fall, uh, late September, early October. You're at 15,000 feet nearly there. And I had the privilege of walking on water because and holy water, as a matter of fact, because it's a sacred lake, because it was frozen for about 100 feet out, so you walk on the <laughs> ice. So this is the uh, Buddhist deity of the mountain. Uh, it's a tutelary deity you invoke in meditation uh, called Demchok. Uh, there's a blue figure embracing a female consort, and the symbolism here is it's a way of awakening spiritual forces within each person. Uh, the active masculine force of compassion, with a female force, spiritual force of wisdom. And when they come together, there's a kind of a bliss, which is symbolized in sexual union, which allows you to attain enlightenment for the sake of everyone else. So here is a Tibetan woman who has gone to the mountain. You don't climb it, you walk around it. You treat it like a religious monument, uh, circumambulate it. And you can see the joy radiating out of her face from having come to this mountain, which is also viewed as the center of the universe. And so in coming to the center of the universe, she touches the center of who she is. Some uh, pilgrims do full length body prostrations all the way around. It's about 50 kilometers, takes them three weeks. Took us about two and a half days to go around the mountain over an 18 and a half thousand foot pass. Some people come with a minimal amount of equipment. Here's a pilgrim going barefoot across the snow. And the high point at 18 and a half thousand feet is the pass of the saviors. This Tibetan woman with the prayer flags in the background is leaving a piece of herself like an old tooth or lock of hair, symbolizing that she's relinquishing attachment to her isolated ego in order to attain enlightenment for the benefit of everyone else. So uh, often, as I mentioned, Mount Sinai, uh, you know, in the West, we sometimes think, well, you know, sacred mountains don't play an important role. In fact, they really do. The three most important events in the Torah, in the Old Testament, are the three covenants. And all three covenants are made on mountains, uh, Mount Ararat, Mount Moriah, and in particular, Mount Sinai. Uh, in Exodus, the people are led out of Egypt and they come to the mountain. Moses goes up on it. And here is the passage from uh, Exodus. Now, Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended abundant in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended uh, let me just get things out of the way here. Uh, as the smoke of a furnace and the whole mount quaked greatly, and when the voice of the ram's horn waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai to the top of the mount, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mount, and Moses went up. So the summit of the mountain is the meeting place of man and God, or people and God, and so forth. And, of course, Moses brings down the Ten Commandments from the height of the mountain. Uh, here is a medieval Psalter actually showing Moses. So here's Moses at the burning bush at the foot of Mount Sinai, and here he is bringing the tablets of the law down from Mount Sinai, which in, uh, middle, in the Middle Ages was sort of depicted like a uh, toothpaste being squeezed out of a tube, as you can see. <laughs> um, so uh, the mountain that's usually identified with Mount Sinai, it's very unclear in the Bible where it is, 
is Jebel Musa, the mountain of Moses and the southern Sinai Peninsula. And it's mainly uh, the, the site of Mount Sinai for Christians. This is one of the oldest uh, Christian monasteries in the world. It's the Monastery of St. Catherine, fortified monastery that's supposed to be built on the site of the burning bush right there. Uh, this is the abbot of uh, St. Catherine. He's Greek Orthodox. And a very interesting thing happened. In the late 1980s, after uh, Israel had given the Sinai back to Egypt, the Egyptian government announced plans to build a cable car up to the top of Jebel Musa, or Mount Sinai, and build a casino on the summit. This aroused ire all over the world, and they were shamed out of doing it. But down the valley, there was an appropriate culturally appropriate place uh, where they built a hotel on the site of the making of the golden calf and money. <laughs> so uh, speaking of the golden calf, we went up to the summit and spent the night there. And my son, David, who was, uh, you know, around, I guess, 10, 12 about the time, he said, dad, you've got to take a picture of that. And it looked like the earth and Cecil B. DeMille's movie, the 10 commandments opening up to receive the worshipers of the, uh, the golden calf you know, flung into hell. There's a village down there and the light of the village is lighting up the sides of the Wadi or Canyon and the stars are speaking in a time exposure. So coming back here, we're making, just having a small sampling of sacred mountains. Sacred mountains are very important in North America, especially for various uh, Indian nations and tribes. And here in California, we have Mount Shasta, which of course is uh, up, up above. Uh, the Northern California, and there are all sorts of modern contemporary groups for whom it's sacred, at least a hundred of them, who uh, believe in Lemurians, uh, all sorts of uh, groups. But the mountain has traditionally been sacred to a number of tribes in the area, and they include, for example, uh, the Wintu, the Shasta, the Pitt River, the Ajumwai, uh, Modoc, Karak. And what you see here is a sacred spring on the side of Shasta at Panther Meadows, and the woman in uh, the blue sweater is Flora Jones. She was a spiritual doctor and healer, and she's doing a ceremony here. Now, this whole area this spring was threatened by the expansion of a ski resort, which would have been a desecration of this sacred site. And the Indians tried to get it stopped with the Religious Freedom Act. Courts have a great, in the U.S., have a great deal of difficulty dealing with natural sacred sites. If it's a church or a synagogue, fine, sacred, don't touch it. But if it's a natural site, very difficult. So the way they got it protected was to go to the Historic Preservation Act and saying that people had been coming here for centuries to perform ceremonies, so it was protected and the ski area was not built there. Now, coming back down toward us, of course, there's Yosemite Valley, which was very sacred to John Muir. And in fact, this is one of his quotes, um, climb the mountains and get their good tidings. Nature's peace will flow into you as sunshine flows into trees. The winds will blow their own freshness into you and the storms their energy while cares will drop off like autumn leaves. You can see half dome here. Um, so uh, the origins of the modern day environmental movement are in the writings of people like uh, Muir and Thoreau, Emerson and so on. And, uh, you know, the uh, primary motivation for preserving places like Yosemite, wilderness areas and mountains was as places people could go to for spiritual renewal, uh, which is a, a major role of sacred mountains. Now, I directed a program as a result of writing the first book within an organization called the Mountain Institute. Uh, we called it the Sacred Mountains Program, and we worked with a number of national parks, including Yosemite, developing interpretive materials based on the evocative cultural and spiritual associations of different features uh, of nature in cultures all around the world. So one of the projects we did was at Yosemite. This was an exhibit on the major national parks around the theme of the inspirational value of wilderness and nature. And... Um, each of these uh, photographs was of a particular park by a photographer named Stan Jorstad. And then we developed quotes, a little description of the, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the particular park and when it was founded, and then an evocative quote. So for Yosemite, we found this quote uh, by, again, this is uh, Muir. This was a, a letter that he wrote to uh, 
Ralph Waldo Emerson trying to get him to come to Yosemite. I invite you to join me in a month's workshop with nature in the high temples of the great Sierra crown beyond our holy Yosemite. It will cost you nothing save the time and very little of that for you will be mostly in eternity. Now, another one of these uh, uh, plaques was of Great Smoky Mountains. And in this case, it was a quote by this Cherokee Indian elder storyteller here. His name is Jerry Wolf. And here is what was with Great Smoky Mountains. The Great Smoky Mountains, which are on the border of North Carolina and Tennessee, the Great Smoky Mountains are a sanctuary for the Cherokee people. We have always believed the mountains and streams provide all that we need for survival. We hold these mountains sacred, believing that the Cherokees were chosen to take care of the mountains as the mountains take care of us. A wonderful sort of reciprocal relationship between humans and nature and the value of how they both reinforce each other and, and a great message, environmental message in and of itself. Now, Jerry at this point was uh, pointing out some buzzards and we did a project at Great Smoky Mountains uh, in which uh, we walked along the trail with Jerry, and he pointed out various natural features and connected them to Cherokee stories and traditions of a spiritual nature. So here he's pointing to some buzzards or vultures that are flying. And well, the Cherokee origin myth of the mountains here, the Great Smoky Mountains, is that uh, in the beginning, the earth was very muddy and too soft for people to stand on. So the great buzzard went out to dry it with his wings. And where his wingtips went down, pushed down valleys. Where the wingtips went up, uh, pushed up mountains. And that's why it's so mountainous. So here is a wayside sign along this trail illustrating that. And there are a whole series of these signs. This is by a contemporary Cherokee artist. And here, in the words of a storyteller and Jerry Wolf, are it's in English and over on the right in Cherokee and their syllabary. So it was a way of reinforcing Cherokee language, among other things. This syllabary, incidentally, was developed by Sequoia, and our giant sequoias here in California are named for him. And this is uh, one of the uh, signs along the river. Uh, it was a, a short trail of about a mile and a half uh, going down the river into the Cherokee uh, reservation called the Kuala Boundary. Another park we worked at was uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Uh, in particular, focusing on Kilauea, one of the most active volcanoes in the world. And here you see the lava flowing off of Kilauea into the ocean. Now, when we arrived there, there was a committee of native Hawaiian elders that was advising the park on cultural matters. They were uh, a bit perturbed by the painting of Pele. First, I should say that the fire goddess Pele Basically, the volcano, the lava, everything is uh, a part of her body. She's very big in Hawaii, um, a very important figure there. And there was a painting of her in the visitor center that had been done by uh, an Anglo back in the 20s. And if you look closely, her hair is on fire. She doesn't look particularly Hawaiian. She looks more like uh, a blonde surfer from California. So they wanted something more traditional. So we had money from the Ford Foundation. We made it available. They put out a call for a traditional painting of Pele and uh, a press release. And the two major papers in Honolulu, uh, on the main island there, did front page articles. And the next thing the park knew, uh, the all the art stores on the big island of Hawaii were sold out of supplies. Mm -hmm. And they got inundated with a tsunami of art, something like 140 paintings. They were working 12-hour days. It was an amazing thing. And the Kapuna Committee chose this as the winning painting. Uh, much more traditional. Uh, there's a reference to uh, Pele's uh, sister Hiaka here and the fertility. And you notice her face is very calm and almost compassionate because for Hawaiians, She's not only wrathful, she's also generous because she creates new land for them to live on. And here you see uh, a sacred hula dance being performed next to Halemaumau, which is the crater in the Kilauea caldera where Pele has her abode for Hawaiians. So I'm about to finish up. You might ask, well, uh, let me just read a passage from my book um, with this picture of Machu Picchu. So the question here is, let me, let me just read it. For most of us, sacred mountains are remote from the experience of everyday life. 
They lie far off in space and time, revered by distant cultures, many of which vanished long ago. Even the peaks that we managed to climb and visit rise on the borders of our lives, removed from the cities and plains where most of us live. What is the value then of thinking about them? It is simply this, the contemplation of sacred mountains with their special power to awaken another deeper way of experiencing reality opens us to a sense of the sacred in our own homes and communities, a sense that we need to cultivate in order to live in harmony with our environment and with each other. In looking up to the heights and reflecting on the world around them, we discover within ourselves something that enables us to lead deeper and more meaningful lives. So I'll just finish with, if you're interested in learning a lot more about many more sacred mountains, uh, this is my book, uh, the second edition, uh, which was recently published by Cambridge University Press. So thanks. I will turn it back over to you, George. Well, that was great, Ed. And I, I, uh, the first question I think we would, could talk about, given where you just finished, is uh, you also mentioned in your book that it doesn't need to be mountains. It can be anything else that, that we look at. You mentioned a little earlier also that there's this idea of a mutual relationship between humanity and the earth, um, old ideas of stewardship, etc. cetera. Um, so how do you think that this can influence the environmental movement? You, you, you write a lot about that. And I think that, uh, you know, giving meaning to that is an important thing. So why don't well, we talk about Well, uh, just to back up a little bit, um, I point out actually in the last chapter, uh, mountains uh, have a natural tendency to awaken a sense of the sacred. I mean, they're the most dramatic features of the landscape. They're the points on the earth that are closest to the sky and ideas of divinity and heaven. There are many, many different ways in which mountains are sacred. Um, so I think they're sort of windows. And uh, what happens is you kind of experience the sacredness of the mountains, but that's a window into seeing it everywhere else, mm -hmm. which means the whole environment in which we depend. So uh, that's the first thing, which is, I would say, very important. Um, secondly, uh, if, you know, in order to really motivate people, an example I'll use is here in California. Uh, often the reason for preserving a forest is as a habitat for an endangered species. In fact, there used to be a, a lot of uh, emphasis placed on preserving old growth forests as a habitat of spotted owls, which were endangered. Well, the point is you can come up with all sorts of economic and scientific reasons, but if you take people into an old growth forest or the Muir Woods here in California, there's just an immediate sense of awe and awakening that really connects people. So you need to have uh, something that kind of awakens a sense of connection between people and nature in order to provide uh, the motivation and um, not only the motivation, but the drive to sustain protecting the environment over the long term. Yeah, um, those kind of motives uh, sometimes work and sometimes, uh, you know, go against it. You mentioned that as well. And you mentioned the problem with the Ganges River being too sacred. So why don't you, why don't you uh, give people an idea about you can take it too far, too. So, well, it's not exactly too far. It is, uh, well, myths. And, uh, you know, I talk a lot about uh, myths in this mm -hmm. book. Um, and I should also point out that if you look at myths from the point of view of comparative religion and mythology, they're not necessarily false. They're usually expressions of people's most basic and deepest assumptions about the nature of reality, which may or may not be factually true. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to understand people, you need to get at you know, what it is that either a myth or functioning is the equivalent of a myth for them. Um, so to get back to what you were, you were saying, in the case of the Ganges, so myths, myths can either free you or they can bind you. Mm -hmm. uh, I say two-edged swords. In the case of the Ganges, uh, there's a belief among uh, some Hindus that the river is so sacred and is the body and expression of the goddess Ganga that it cannot be polluted. So you can throw anything into it and the river will automatically cleanse itself, which, of course, creates lots of problems. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there's that. Uh, and then also, if you, you know, there are sacred objects in places where they're used in sacrifice. For example, the temple sacrifice in uh, Jerusalem, uh, you know, during the time when Israel was, uh, had the temple there. You, you took sacred uh, animals and so on, and you sacrificed them. So if something is viewed as sacred, as a sacred sacrifice, 
then you might well take the environment and sacrifice it for something else. Mm -hmm. And that is another problem. So the point is, I think you need to sort of uh, look at the sacredness of things. Uh, you know, what is the value of it in and of itself? And the fact that um, I think we need to have nature uh, in its natural form um, for our own spiritual well-being. Yeah, you, you mentioned also that sometimes uh, some uh, sites become so popular um, that, they, that there's a serious pollution problem just from leaving all their trash behind afterwards. And, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a major problem, especially with certain sacred sites, which can get overwhelmed with too many pilgrims who come revering the place, but they basically inadvertently, because there, there's too much, uh, you know, too many people there, they trash it. Um, I got involved in a project to... Um, try to get the governments of India, Nepal, and China to nominate Mount Kailas and the pilgrimage routes leading to it from India and Nepal as a World Heritage Site. Now, World Heritage Sites are the premier protected areas in the world, but they get a lot of attention. And when a place is designated as a World Heritage Site, tourism will you know, increase exponentially. So it's very important in places like that, and some of them are sacred, that there be a management plan in place to deal with the influx of visitors so they don't overwhelm the site. There's something that people associate, you know, that they don't spend time on the sacredness of it, but just hear about this nature, uh, the nature and mountains um, that bothers them, obviously. And I want you to address it because I think you do a great job in addressing it in, in your book. And that is, uh, so the Aztecs and the Incas and their idea that, that, that in order to get rain, one needed to sacrifice uh, human sacrifices. And um, I wanted to point out that, you know, it, it probably got started at a certain point. Nobody knows how. I mean, it, it happened in many places in the world. Mm -hmm. But so I think an analogy that I would use from a more modern time is the emperor uh, in China liking women with small feet and then having all of the, the uh, mothers buying their children's feet for, for hundreds of years after that until some it was put a stop to. So, um, I think talk about what the history is on that and, 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 and just give us an idea about, as you said, what their, their approach was, their, their, the mythology of it, the image of it, that it made it different in their minds from what it was. Well, uh, since you mentioned women with found feet, mm -hmm. uh, one of the mountains, you know, in each chapter of the book, I sort of describe the mountains and general beliefs for that area, for example, China. Mm -hmm. And then I focus on a few representative mountains. And the most famous mountain in China, sacred mountain, is called Taishan. Mm -hmm. And when I climbed it, there's a staircase of about 7,000 steps going up. And I took a picture of a couple of old ladies in bound feet climbing the mountain with their bound feet. Yeah. And so, yes, uh, since you mentioned that, um, yes, very much so. So sacrifice, yeah, I mean, it's sort of horrifying when you, the Aztecs were really into it, the Incas less so. Um, but, you know, it's also tradition in the West. Uh, you know, the, uh, a major event in the Bible is the Akedah, where, you know, uh, where Abraham goes up to sacrifice his son, Isaac, uh, probably because there was a tradition in, uh, you know, the pre-Jewish uh, religions there, the Canaanite religions of human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So as far as um, I have a colleague, a friend of mine uh, named uh, Johann Reinhardt, and Johann um, uh, is very prominent in the field of high altitude archaeology. Mm -hmm. The highest archaeological and religious sites in the world are not in the Himalayas, but in the Andes. Mm -hmm. And that's because they're close to one of the driest deserts in the world, the Atacama Desert. So the Incas were able to go up to 22,000 feet with yamas, hardly touching snow, mm -hmm. no glaciers. And they would, uh, it was considered an honor, they would take uh, the children of the nobility and take them up there and sacrifice them on the summit. And they were sort of being entrusted as messengers to the mountain gods, probably asking for rain in very dry areas. Um, so the Aztecs did a, a great deal more with this. And, you know, you have this substitute. Um, well, for example, the substitute, well, Jesus is sacrificed on the cross. Mm -hmm. So there's the idea of human sacrifice at the, at the heart of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just for a moment to go back to the story about Abraham uh, and Isaac. I, I always figured that, that he gave a kind of the B-plus answer uh, that Jehovah was looking for rather than the A-plus answer. It's like, uh, because he had 
told him to, to not, you know, he had told Abraham he didn't want any more of this child sacrifice. That was the, one of the big points he was making. And then he asked him years later to sacrifice his own son. And I'm sure Abraham was going, what do I do? I'm, <laughs> uh, you know, and so he started going up and then he was stopped. So uh, that's the B plus answer. He was willing, he was willing to go, but, you know, reluctant. <laughs> Whereas I think the A plus answer would have been said, hey, wait a minute. If you're not any different than Baal, why should I switch? No. And, and then and then and then Jehovah would have said, "Yeah, that, you're the man I want. You're the man I want. That's the my." But a, B plus is good enough. But right. uh, anyway, that's that's the way I look at that story. Yes. Um, well, you know, Jesus is the Lamb of God who sacrificed. Yeah, for, that's you know, the welfare of humanity. Um, the other thing I think of with the Akedai is that you know Abraham didn't consult with Sarah with, with uh, Isaac's mother. I mean, this is pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's, I'm so, sure it caused a rift in their marriage. <laughs> Even after all those years. Um, so uh, you very modestly and briefly talked about your experience um, in the mountain. Uh, you, you describe it in detail in the book, Swimming in the Snow. I, really, I think this was really quite an experience that Ned and you went through. Could you give a little more detail about what it was and how old were you at the time that you did that? It seemed like uh, I was, early in your career. I was about 23. I uh -huh. had gone uh, to Nepal after I graduated from college in the Peace Corps. And um, I went on this expedition to Annapurna. And we were trying, uh, actually, I was with a very good climber. Uh, he'd made a uh, first ascent of Denali, a uh, winter ascent of Denali, which is really cold. I mean, they wrote a book about it called 148 degrees below zero, which was the wind chill factor. Wow. <laughs> Caught it up there. Oh. Anyway, um, he led us up under what's called a hanging glacier, which is a glacier that comes over a cliff and it's slowly moving. And every once in a while, a big chunk in front of it breaks off uh, the way icebergs are made, uh, you know, where glaciers go into the ocean. Um, so we were going up underneath. I didn't want to go there. And I looked up and uh, the glacier broke off. And uh, it was pretty distant. And I remember thinking, oh, some snow just fell, ice just fell. And then this huge cloud billowed up out of the gully. I mean, it was uh, huge. And I could see chunks of ice, blocks of ice on the bottom of it. And uh, it just, it suddenly hit me with absolute certainty because as far as I knew, if you didn't survive an avalanche of that size mm -hmm. with ice, that I was gonna die. And I remember looking around and it was as though all the mountains I was seeing around me were on the screen of a movie theater I was about to step out of. Mm -hmm. And then there was this feeling like the whole universe just flipped over in the pit of my stomach. And then something deep in took over and then I was just watching myself. I was totally freaked out consciously, but I was doing everything very, very precisely as though I knew exactly what I was doing. So as you mentioned, the avalanche hit and then I was going maybe up to a hundred miles an hour. I don't know, avalanches go all sorts of different speeds but I was flying along in it, swimming, hitting things. And it maybe took me a thousand feet down and then it buried me. And what I didn't realize uh, at the time, I learned about it later when I started reading about this, mm -hmm. is when avalanches stop, they set like cement. It's not fluffy snow. Mm -hmm. And I lost my mittens. I couldn't move. I couldn't wiggle my fingers. I couldn't breathe. To me, it was the worst way to go. And for, a, you know, it's very painful for a couple of moments. And then I stopped trying to breathe and then all the fear went away. It was like, you know, there's nothing there to be afraid of. Death wasn't anything. And I started to become part of the snow and ice around me. It was like very pleasant. And all of a sudden when my hands bang and I had an airspace, I could breathe. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, I was thrashing around. I couldn't get out and I had panic. And then this extraordinary calm came over me as it had before. And all of a sudden my body went bang on its own and I popped out sort of like a cork popping out of a bottle. Uh, so that's how I got out of the avalanche. Yeah, that that's a a, a real near death experience. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, you talk about talk about the, the reason that I wanted you to talk about it is because uh, people you, you you talk so much about how people experience things differently in the mountains that there's a crystalline clarity that there's a, a different kind of light um, and that a lot of people who uh, mountaineer and certainly not all of them but a lot of them go for that reason. Um, or, or that that's one of the driving motives is to have that clarity, at least for the time that they're on the mountain. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because mountains, you know, are sacred places. If you look at, um, well, for example, you look at Moses' experience on Sinai in the Bible, you know, sacred experience in the sacred mountain. Uh, you know, sacred mountains aren't just, you know, 
a love and light. Mm -hmm. uh, they're places of power. And that power can appear to be demonic or can be, you know, just totally, you know, in the mountains, you're at the mercy of, of forces like avalanches or storms uh, that can wipe you out very quickly or you make a miss, you fall. So there's the, the you know, the ambivalence. And um, there was a theologian at the beginning of the 20th century, Rudolf Otto, who wrote a book called The Holy, Das Heilige. And he uh, talked about the sacred as being the holy other. He called it the mysterium tremendum et fascinans, mm -hmm. which was sort of the, the mystery that was uh, terrifying and also fascinating. It was both mm -hmm. attractive and in and, and, and the face of which you can be obliterated. So, you know, you don't mess with the sacred, especially in the mountains. Yeah, you, you make another very interesting point in your book about how... Um, Medieval Catholic thought sort of considered wilderness and the mountains as wild, dangerous nature, don't have anything to do with it, uh, scary, demonic. And, and immediately while you were, uh, while I was reading that part of your book, I was thinking of Night on Bald Mountain by Mussorgsky. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Et cetera. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, Night on Bald Mountain, there's um, a phenomenon you see in the mountains, and I've only seen it really on sacred mountains. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, New Zealand, uh, on Haleakala, in uh, Hawaii, and a mountain in Ecuador. And it's called the glory. And that is if you're early in the morning or late in the afternoon, and it's on a ridge, and it's sunny on one side and misty on the other, your shadow gets projected into the mist, and this angelic figure with a halo appears around it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, in China, there's a mountain where it happens quite frequently, and that is something that people go to see. They call it the Buddha's glory mm -hmm. because they, they consider it the manifestation of a bodhisattva, an enlightenment being. Mm -hmm. in the Hearts Mountains, where you're talking about Night on Bald Mountain, mm -hmm. it's called the specter of Brocken, and mm -hmm. it's demonic. So it's kind of like what you're saying. Yeah. And one of the reasons that the um, you know, uh, wild places and so on became uh, viewed as rather demonic was that they were the sites, especially groves and mountains, of older pre-Christian rituals by the Druids and the Celts. Mm -hmm. And so when Christianity came in, they wanted to subdue and the, those religions. So basically they cut down the groves and uh, they converted, I would maintain, that mountains in Europe and the Alps during the Celtic period before Christianity came in were probably divine because you see records of that but the hills preserved in Ireland and in England, but not on the continent. And then Christianity came in and they became demonic. So uh, the Alps were places where, you know, where dragons hang, hung out and witches and demonic forces and you stayed away from them. Um, sacred, but in the sort of negative sense, yeah. the terrifying sense. And then with the enlightenment and the romantic period and the interest in nature through science, uh, and you can see this in the writings of people like Goethe and Shelley, uh, the mountains become places that are sublime and even divine. And that coincides exactly with the birth of modern mountain climbing or alpinism. Mm -hmm. um, you, you also talk about, I mean, people who have had the ability to, to or as you mentioned in, in uh, India and Asia, people who climb mountains without any equipment at all and, um, seem to not freeze to death. Uh, do, do they not lose their toes, you know, to frostbite and stuff like that? Or do they just lose it and don't mind? Or, or is there magic involved or no magic? <laughs> well, I don't know magic. I mean, there are certain yogic practices. Um, I got involved in a project. This is what's new in the second edition. I, I got involved after the first edition was published in 1990 originally. I got involved in a number of environmental projects. And one of them was at a the major Hindu pilgrimage place in the Himalayas, a place called Badrinath. And there was a tree planting ceremony that I was, took part in there, uh, planting trees as sacred objects. And there was a holy man who ran around naked. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, uh, uh, he was a naked sadhu, and he was the one who blessed the trees. Now, he would never make it here in the U.S. because, you know, he would have been arrested getting off the plane. Mm -hmm. But prime ministers like Indira Gandhi would come to him for blessings in India. I mean, he ran around with just a penis ring. That was about it. Mm -hmm. um, so the story about him was that he went up above Badrinath to about 15,000 feet in the winter. It gets very snowy and cold up there in the Himalayas. And he just sat there in the altogether and let the snow pile up around him. 
and uh, a military uh, scouting party was you know, going around in the snow and they saw his trident sticking out of the snow and they dug down and there he was meditating happily away in the altogether. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a general who came to this tree planting ceremony. He said, you know, he, it was really worth it to come to get the darshan, you know, the presence of somebody who could do something like that. Yeah. And there was a, a, another speaker on a different topic about a year and a half ago was talking about uh, uh, some yogis who develop ability to create body heat, you know, yeah. to, to give off body heat. And he was talking about how they would test themselves by putting wet uh, blankets on them and, and see how long it took to dry as a sort of contest, the, the yogic Olympics, you know, how long does it right. take you to dry? And I, I, first of all, I mean, it's, it's interesting to be able to be able to uh, meditate in the snow without freezing to death. But I always thought, you know, how many years did it take you to learn to dry out that blanket um, and all the skill that you that went into that, which could have been applied to something else, because we know how to dry those sheets. You know, we can <laughs> put them out in the sun. You know, so <laughs> but but it, it's not obviously. I'm, I'm joking about it, but it's it's obviously not that. It's to try to to give an impression that the, the material world is subject to our wills, as opposed to the material world uh, forcing itself on us. You know, the the difference between are we just material or are we minds. Basically. That's a very good point. Yeah, excellent point. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, that's uh, the Tibetans practice that in the winter mm -hmm. up on the plateau, and it's uh, they do it by, you know, meditating. They sort of do a special breathing, and they visualize a corkscrew flame going up their spine, mm -hmm. heating their body. Um, but it, you know, I don't know the answer to your question as to how long it takes to uh, develop that ability. That ability to do it, <laughs> and then some people. I remember um, I was reading us. Uh, Ed Hillary, you know, climbed Everest, the mm -hmm. first person to climb Everest. He spent a winter with uh, the scientific expedition about 19,000 feet. And they were up there in the winter. I mean, it's really cold at that altitude. And uh, this Nepali guy came walking up barefoot and then slept out in the snow with no problems. And apparently they all, he also liked chewing up test tubes and, and eating the glass. So, <laughs> this was a scientific expedition that observed him doing this. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, well, it's interesting what those skills are put to. That's, that you know, we, we right. I think what, the way you look at it and what, what, what uh, the sort of, as you mentioned a little earlier, the Enlightenment thinkers kind of took the demonic uh, thing and set it aside and created more of a secular interest in everything, but at least brought it closer back to not being afraid of just the, the objects of nature. But yeah. how do you live with them? Um, but of course, the other end of it is to just use up everything um, that there is and ruin it. And uh, it's, it's a big problem for our planet as to what we're going to do about it, right? And, 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 right. and how, far, how far are we going to go before we realize it? And, but, you know, we can't really just take it from nature because most animals, if given a chance, will, will populate and eat until they've ruined their area, too. Yeah. There, aren't, yeah. there aren't other animals who, who fix uh, it up. And so it really is a matter of will, not of nature, uh, uh, as to how we're going to deal with, with our life on this planet and how long we're going to share it uh, with each other and also with the other animals, because they're not going to take care of it, right? That's true. No, that's a very good point. Um, and, and, you know, it's, for example... One of the points I make is that uh, in India, for example, the, the glacier that's at the source of the Ganges, the sacred source of the Ganges, which is the most sacred uh, river in the world for hundreds of millions of Hindus, it's retreating. Mm -hmm. And that's created alarm with environmentalists and also Hindus. Mm -hmm. And so there were environmental, Hindu environmental activists who were trying to use this to bring pressure on the Indian government um, to uh, reduce... Uh, you know, carbon emissions, uh, you know, to counteract uh, climate change. Uh, and, you know, that, ar that argument, you know, has possibilities. The trouble is the Indians are kind of between a rock and a hard place mm -hmm. because it's getting hotter and hotter, uh, getting to the point where people may no longer be able to survive in large parts of India and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And the way people survive is with air conditioning, if they have the money for it. Mm -hmm. And the problem is to get the electricity for the air conditioning at this point, they have to generate it from coal, mm -hmm. which creates a bigger problem. So, you know, there are a lot of these things. And it, it's, um, 
it's not you have to do more than just have a belief in something. For example, Taoism is a very nature oriented religion in China. Mm -hmm. You know, basically what you try to do is get in touch with the Tao, which flows through nature and motivation for protecting it. Um, But, you know, China, even though there were a lot of Taoists there, uh, they deforested China long before the Europeans got around to doing that. Mm -hmm. So it's got to be combined with action. Yeah. And it's also, you know, I mean, there's the the necessity, not the necessity, but the the impulse, impulse, the total push for more and more people which right. is you know more or less unstoppable and uh, or i mean we can slow it down we can think about it i mean and things have been changed but how are you going to slow that down and stop it i mean china tried um but that didn't work either just to bring it down to one child yeah. um, no, it's a serious a serious question a serious problem and yeah. and i have a whole section a new section in the book on the yeah. uh you know, the impact of uh, climate change on the sacredness of mountains and how people are responding and what they're trying to do to counteract it yeah that, that's why i brought it up here. i thought that was a very good way to combine other people's interest in the mountains you know and and, and what's going on on our planet either from a secular point of view or from a religious point of view right. another point that you brought up that's just just to briefly mention yeah. you you mentioned that the Taoists in china uh, consider the mountains sacred and you couldn't go on them. And then the Buddhists came along and wanted to ascend to their peaks. That must have been a, a, a problematic tra- transition period. Well, actually, um, well, here's what happened, actually. Uh, Taoists did go up in the mountains uh, uh-huh. because that was the place. In fact, the Chinese term for uh, going, you know, embarking on a spiritual practice is literally to enter the mountains because the mountains are the ideal place to go to for meditation and spiritual transformation, but they were dangerous places. And it wasn't until about 400 uh, AD that mm-hmm. attitudes changed and, uh, you know, Chinese started to going into the mountains uh, for recreation and so on. And, and uh, in fact, they got into mountain climbing and uh, recreating in the mountains over a thousand years before Europeans ever did. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, so there, there is that, the, uh, the dangerous part of it. Can you repeat the, the question you had? Because I've, I've lost a... No, just just the transition between Taoism and... and oh, okay, Taoism. Well, yeah. and, and in fact, so... And in fact, the earliest emperors of China, um, you know, the legendary emperors about the third millennium BCE, mm-hmm. uh, they climb mountains. Uh, it was a practice of the emperor to climb a mountain. So what's interesting is so the Taoists, um, they view, you know, the mountains... Well, landscape is mountains and rivers, Shan Shui. Uh, that's, that's, uh, so that they're there and, and they would climb them. They started climbing it, but there was an older tradition of climbing mountains, um, which is interesting because in Buddhism, which you find in India and Tibet, and then in China and Japan, in, um, well, originally in India and now in Tibet, the practice is not to climb a mountain. You circumambulate it, mm-hmm. which is uh, what we saw going around Mount Kailas. But the Buddhist religion in China and Japan is to ritually climb the mountain to the summit, even though it's nominally the same religion. Right. But I think it goes back to the older uh, practice of emperors climbing mountains. Yeah, your book is filled with uh, lots of nuances and detail like this, and uh, we're just scratching the surface here. Um, but I would like to bring in a couple of questions that our audience has uh, asked. Uh, so, uh, woman Susan Hopp asks, you speak about respecting the earth and its ability to regenerate life. In the time of the Anthropocene, do you believe the human race can actually shift away from the lack of respect in our actions? Do you, do you have hope, I guess, is the, is the main question here. Yes, yes, I have hope. I mean, mm-hmm. if for no other reason, when things get really bad, um, there will be a shift. And I think there's a growing recognition that um, climate change and the extinction of species, the Anthropocene, you know, it can't go on. And I think, you know, the younger generation is especially concerned about this because they're going to inherit the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you find a lot of uh, younger people who are are taking action and they'll eventually get into positions of uh, political power and economic power. And I think they'll have an impact on changing the way we we relate to nature and the environment and reducing climate change. So it's certainly, I mean, look at today. Now everybody is aware of climate change. Mm -hmm. It used to be something that everyone denied. Now, even the people who are, you know, uh, who are, let's say, uh, climate change deniers, they don't necessarily deny climate change. They just deny that humans are causing it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what, what can we do when the sunspots do most of it or the volcanoes? Yeah. 
And mountains are, you know, like the Arctic and the Antarctic. They're the uh, canaries uh, that, you know, that, that's where you see the impacts first is up in the mountains, especially with uh, snow and glaciers retreating and disappearing. Uh, one question I wanted to ask you, which is totally off the, the point, but uh, you brought it up. You, the plate tectonics, which has given us this information about where mountains come from. And so the mountains, uh, most, if not all, of the mountains of the world are either due to plate tectonics, where the plates hit each other, or due to volcanoes. And volcanoes are partially due to the plate tectonics too, right? Are there mountains that are created that are not from either of those sources? Um, well, that's a very good question. Um, the main mountain ranges, like the Sierra Nevada, that's plate tectonics tectonics colliding. The Himalayas, which are the youngest, highest range, that's uh, the uh, Indian subcontinent colliding with Asia mm -hmm. and pushing up not only the Himalayas, but the Tibetan Plateau. Now, you do have these hot spots, and they're not the result of colliding tectonic plates. Mm -hmm. So Hawaii is an example. There is, a, what can you say, sort of a, a thin place in the crust where magma is coming up, and the plates are moving. They're not colliding. So mm -hmm a plate moves over the hot spot and a mountain erupts. So you get actually, as a result of this, you have the tallest mountain in the world there, mm -hmm. which is Mount Akea, which is about 35, 33,000 feet high because its base is 20,000 feet under the ocean and it's almost 14,000 feet high. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Hawaiian islands, uh, the, the plate tonic, the plates have moved. So the Northern islands used to be over that hot spot, and now they've shifted up and the hot spot is now, on the southern part of the big island of Hawaii and moving out into the ocean. Mm -hmm. So uh, are you suggesting that anybody who wants to make money on real estate in the future should buy some of that water? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so here's another question, and this is a question I had for, for you myself too, so I'm glad that it's being asked. Having survived the avalanche, did you ever climb again? And if so, did you ever fear another similar accident that could have more severe effects? The, actually, he's, he's gone through quite a few uh, near-death experiences. But you can tell us about a couple of other. No, ones. no, 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 not not really. I, I, first of all, I'm very cautious. I didn't want to be going where we were going. Two other people led us up under this avalanche. I knew it was a very dangerous place, mm -hmm. uh, but it was. You know, we were at 19, 20,000 feet. We had heavy packs on, and there was fresh snow that was knee deep. So they'd already broken a trail, and it's sort of hard to you know, go off on your own. We were about to do that. Um, Yes, I actually, the peak I showed uh, above Tengboshe Monastery in the first slides, mm -hmm. I climbed that about a month or two, less than a month after the avalanche. And that was the most difficult peak I've climbed. Uh, I didn't, you know, I climbed for a while and then I got married and uh, my wife wasn't terribly keen on my climbing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also what I found was I went to Nepal with the Peace Corps and my interest sort of shifted from climbing mountains to trekking and walking among the mountains and being in it. And in a way, um, you know, walking through the mountains is a fuller experience because you go up over high passes, you may climb peaks, but you go down through fields and forest into villages and up. In it. And it's also a better metaphor for life because life is a series of ups and downs, like trekking through range after range of mountains. It's not always going for a peak experience. Right. And, you know, the other thing is you get up to the top, but you can't stay there forever. No. You've got to come down. So what do you bring back from the summit of the mountain? And I talk about that in the last yeah. chapter of the book, which is very important, I think. Yeah, it's crucial, I think. Um, and uh, why don't you talk about what do you bring back? Well, first of all, when you're up there, uh, you can see all the landscape around you. So you, you get a sense of your place in the world, which you don't see from down in the valleys. So when you come back, if you can sort of remember that, it orients you. Um, also, you get up there, there's a sense of exaltation. Uh, you know, you've made it to the summit. Um, and, and you have a sense of beauty and accomplishment. If you can bring that back down, that's fine. But the high, you can't really bring back down. Mm. Uh, what I notice is when you go up a mountain, if it's a perfectly shaped mountain like a pyramid, what happens is when you reach the summit, you not only reach the high point of the mountain, you reach its center. Mm -hmm. And that sense of being in the center of the world and being centered in yourself is something that's very useful in life. Because if you can maintain a sense of being centered, it gives you stability as you negotiate all the, you know, the, the turmoil of daily life and so on. Sort of, and, and in meditation, 
one of the important things in meditation, many traditions, is to develop that sense of being centered and realizing that the center is everywhere, which is an amusing thing because yeah. <laughs> um, I, had a, I had a, well, here's the amusing thing. Um, when I was doing my PhD, one of my mentors, um, I mentioned to him that my undergraduate degree was in math. And I said, well, you know, if the universe is an infinite sphere, mm -hmm. then every point in the universe is the center. <laughs> because that's defined as a point that's equidistant from the circumference, and every point is, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can feel you're centered and everyone else is centered. It's, you don't have to fight over who's at the center. And he said, <laughs> yes, that was the medieval definition of God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, I was going to, uh, there wasn't time for it, but you answered it anyway. I was going to ask that every, every, every sacred mountain wants to be the center of the cosmos. How, how can that be possible? But you just answered that. Well, as a um, matter of fact, um, yeah, one of the points I make is that people often say, well, what is the common theme of all mountains? And I don't think any, uh, there's any universal theme or view of mountains. There are 10 that I've identified that are particularly widespread. Mm -hmm. uh, there are scholars who say every sacred mountain must be a center in a cosmic axis unifying everything. Well, that's true of certain mountains like Kailas, but other mountains, no, uh, like yeah. the San Francisco peaks in Arizona, for example, no. Um, so uh, there's another thing I go into on what's, what's more universal that has to do more with the process. But I think it's very important to look at the many, the richness of the many diverse ways in which mountains are sacred, not only traditionally and religiously, but also in a secular sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go out and have an experience of wonder and awe or a place that has some special significance for you, you feel in touch with nature, that's also a sacred experience, mm -hmm. whether or not it's religious in nature. Well, you're talking about center. We only have a couple of minutes left. You're talking about being centered um, and taking that with you. That was one of the things that struck me about your description of a couple of your close calls. Um, is that you stayed centered the way you described I mean you, you panicked and then you got centered again and you panicked and you got centered again and you survived and you also went and got Ned out of his he was also uh, stuck in the avalanche and, and got him out but there's another experience where you where you uh, took a walking stick uh, when when you were told not to and it saved your life so uh, why don't you why don't you end with that story because it's also uh, on, not on the top of a huge peak or anything but in, in Greece I think it was right yes yeah, so, well it was on Mount Athos in northern Greece mm -hmm. which is a long peninsula with about twenty Byzantine monasteries it's the center of Eastern Orthodox Christianity you can only go there as a pilgrim uh, I'm not I'm Jewish but uh, it was fine they hosted me there and. Mount Athos itself at the end of the peninsula is about over 6,000 feet high, but it's this beautiful pyramid of marble and limestone that rises sheer out of the Aegean on three sides. And so uh, I didn't think I could climb it when I went there around Easter because I thought it was too early in the season, too much snow. But there was a, a Frenchman who was a classical music composer who was wandering around getting inspiration to write a piece of classical music for the city of Thessaloniki. And he said, yeah, I've heard you can go up there. So I went up and on the way up, I, I didn't have an ice axe. So I cut a, a stick and I was using it as a staff and I got right near the summit and I went over on the shady side, which was icy. And there was a big drop of thousands of feet and it started to get very slick. And I was able to take my stick and ram it into the snow and hang on, got by that spot. And then I went down on the sunny side where it wasn't icy like that. Well, we're, we're lucky that you hung on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, as I say, I'm pretty cautious. Uh, so, you know, I don't go out of my way looking for, you know, terrifying experiences. And I haven't done technical climbing in years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the beauty of sacred mountains is you don't have to climb them. You don't even have to walk around them. You can contemplate them from the distance, or you can even think about them. Uh, and that has its effect. I said you haven't done any technical climbing for years, and uh, we have an idea about what you mean by that. And most people our age are thinking, I don't want to climb a ladder anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not doing Well, I, I do climb ladders. But, yeah, <laughs> so climbing is with a rope and you know, <laughs> snow and ice and rock. Um, yeah. But, you know, you were telling me at the beginning that you uh, did an Outward Bound program and mm -hmm. went up in the White Mountains. Uh, where yeah. Did you climb Mount Washington in that course? We did not get to the top of Mount Washington, but we did go along the ridge for, for several days, uh, uh, you know, near there. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, it's it's only 6,000 feet high, but uh, as far as I know, it has the highest recorded wind velocity in the world on the summit. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's pretty extreme.
yeah, I'm not, I'm not unhappy that I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. That was great. And uh, as I said, there's lots more detail in the book, both uh, for mountains all the way around the world and what everybody thought of them uh, in history and also uh, how this can affect both your own personal life, but also uh, maybe how we think about how we're living on this planet. So thank you very much for sharing that with us, Edwin. Well, um, thank you. it was great to do this with you. I really enjoyed it. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, and so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its almost 120th year of enlightened discussion. <laughs> thank you. See you again.